Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all the presenters and the performers. I'm really uh, proud to have been a part of this. We'll be moving into um, our second session, and um, Gregory Pond will be taking over as moderator. Um, I'll tell you a little about, about Gregory. Gregory Pond was born in Brooklyn, New York, to Panamanian parents. He is the author and publisher of four books of poetry, a member of LERNA, Revolutionary Poets Brigade, and Queer Rebels, and facilitates Poetically Speaking, a call-in program for seniors. He is a member of the Cultural Committee. Gregory, are you ready? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And um, welcome, everybody, those, who, those of you who are just joining us. Uh, we're into our second session, and this is entitled Global Dimensions. So we're going to move a little bit around the world in this one. And um, we are going to start um, in Europe and more specifically in Italy. And I'm gonna read the uh, bio of the next two presenters. And uh, first of all, we have Anna Lombardo. Anna lives in Venice. She's a poet, cultural activist, and freelance translator. She has been the art director of the International Poetry Festival, Palabra en el Mundo, in Venice since 2009. She believes that poetry can unite people worldwide and raise awarenesses, awareness towards the principles of solidarity and make peace constructive and concrete. And um, along with uh, Anna will be Mariella Setsu. Mariella is a poet and activist and became convinced anti-militarist a long time ago, observing her land, the island of Sardinia, subject to tremendous war games on the wide military ranges that were imposed on its territory. For most of her life, Mariella has been a teacher of English in various state schools. She's engaged in a grassroots union for school workers. And so we'll uh, begin with uh, Anna, giving a, a presentation followed by Mariella. Hi. Hi, everybody. And thank you very much to have, to have me again to continue this, um, this, this Jack's vision that we start last year. And although I have, I'm not uh, any, a historian or an economist, uh, of course, I'm a poet, I think that at this point, we cannot deny that the um, dictatorial economic position reached by the capitalistic system worldwide. And of course, we cannot forget that the capitalistic system has its roots deeply in the patriarchal system. And it has shown clearly an incredible ability to be flexible because it has economic values against human values at its core. Soon after the Second World War, the fascist party became illegal in Italy, by, um, but calling it legal wasn't sufficient to ban it, its ideology from people's lives and from the democratic system as we call it now. Um, I'm saying this because I think it can help us to understand better how all the fascist values, which are homeland, God and family, uh, have been always in play. The clearance of fascist ideology has begun many decades ago with the complicity of many politicians and friendly uh, governments. I'm essentially a poet, and so it is with this, uh, all my limits that I'll offer some points of reflections and insights into what's going on in Italy after the far-right coalition won the election on the 25th of September of this year. And how, I think, the fascist ideology had penetrated into what we call the democratic system. It is under, because it was under this so-called democratic system that the political party called Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, not sister, I mentioned, I mentioned it, gained most of the consent among voters this year. A party that has its roots deeply into the fascist ideology and in the past elections as minimal fans around the country. How this happens? 
I think most likely because the capitalist system is not so democratic and it has an incredible flexibility to adjust itself in every situation. For centuries, it has established itself as the accepted political system across the world. And the true centuries, it has found a way to turn every victory that workers, the political movement, uh, women movement, etc., obtained into its advantages. In Italy, for the first time in our history, we have a woman at the head of the government. Great. But we cannot forget that this woman has embraced the fascist doctrine, the fascist credo, homeland, God and the family. And there's a started to conform to it because these are the backbones of her politics. And the fascist credo, believe me, didn't die with Mussolini's death in Italy. It continued to be held across the world by both dictatorial and democratic politicians or governors who run countries in all over the world, in USA, Russia, Europe, or whatever. Uh, because there are their backbones. And look how this fascist ideology started to work in Italy as soon as the far-right coalition won the election. The first moves were to try to close our ports, preventing the immigrants from disembarking and pass a bunch of restrict restrictive uh, proposals. Soon after a rave party held in Tuscany a few weeks ago, for example, they presented a law against the rave parties and the occupation of public spaces. Still under this law, public meetings are also in discussion, especially those organized by people regarding sensitive issues like climate change, abortion, or the rights of LGBTQ plus community, for example. Another proposal on their tape was allowed to give a status of a citizen to the fetus, practically making every abortion sounds like a homicide and undermining the right of women to choose. They've already expect, expressed their will to cut off the basic income for those who didn't have a job. They want to introduce a kind of a merit system into the public education system. And last but not least, they're coming back up with an older Berlusconian project of building a bridge to unite Sicily's island to the peninsula, no regard at all for the negative environment aspects. And certainly, I'm sure they are preparing other similar laws and proposals, but those I listed here made me think again about the old fascist ideology, homeland, God, family and how this capitalist system makes it works across the world. In terms of local policy, there are repercussions too. In fact, this far-right government isn't going to stop the strict regulations put in place by our local government that are aimed not only to limit our freedom and movement, but also at mining our privacy in a hazardous way, I should say. On January 2023, in fact, every person coming to Venice must buy a ticket in advance. According to them, this procedure will be necessary in order to stop the mass of tourists that every day are putting this old town at risk. Now, there were a lot of protests by Venetian committees, like um, the one against the big ship. Maybe you heard about, about that. Um, against the danger of a tourism and monoculture and the attempt to use this town as a Disneyland and damage the fragile ecosystem of the lagoon. And the response to those problems will be to oblige everyone coming into the city, buy a ticket and explain why he or she is coming here. This is a clear invasion of our privacy and reinforces the ideology of security and control all over the people. On top of that, when you decide to come here, you will receive a QR, which you must always bring to attest you have the permit to be here. And that reminds me of how, the, about the star that the Jewish people had to use during that terrible time. Plus, if I have some friends or relatives coming to visit me, for example, I have to denounce they are coming to the police. 
of course, as Venetian citizens, we are trying to stop this authoritative course, but I'm afraid that with this new far right government, we have a long, a long fight ahead. I just want to uh, coming back um, a little bit to the uh, concept of capitalistic system, in particular, uh, the, the intention, how the intention of closing the, the ports uh, um, meet with this idea of, of defend, defense the, the homeland. I think it's important to, to have this in, in, in mind. Um, as poets, I think that our responsibility is not only to be a constant testimony of all that is what is happening, but to be a kind of a constant echo, a persistent, constructive and choral voices and the bodies for hope to everyone suffering injustice and the wars across the world. And um, of course, uh, Adelaide, I cannot end this conversation uh, with you without remembering the brave fight that the Iranian women have put on underlining that the violence against the women was and is the first step that shifts every democratic system into a dictatorial one. The control of women's bodies, their exploitation at every latitude in the world is again, once again, the face of the old patriarchal system constantly in bed with the new forms of the capitalistic system. And the fight of the Iranian women after the killing of Mash Azim cannot be stopped and must be supported not only by women, but especially by the majority of men across the world. Thank you. I think my time is up. Wow. Thank you, Anna. That was, that was wonderful and, and just very informative to let us get that perspective internationally and particularly in, in what's going on in Europe and in I Iran as well. Um, Marielle is next. I think you're muted. Okay, right. So um, I would like to, to point uh, at uh, um, <clears throat> uh, a question. Uh, that is uh, <clears throat> central, I think, in capitalism, that is imperialism. Um, uh, I live uh, in Sardinia, uh, in uh, the center of Mediterranean, in Cagliari, in the south of the island. And uh, uh, we can feel even um, from this uh, side of the world uh, that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> our area, that is our wide region, North Africa and Middle East, is uh, destabilized, uh, heavily destabilized. Um, uh, uh, um, so, you know, in uh, North African countries, uh, um, uh, bursts uh, of social exasperation and revolt uh, have been exploited uh, by um, <clears throat> uh, Western imperialism uh, to engage a war against the states and governors. And that's the case of Libya. And a similar scheme uh, occurred in Syria. Um, so these places of the world are troubled by war, economic problem, desertification, uh, see the phenomenon of mass migration, um, part of them trying to reach Europe. Um, so the Eastern side, you know, um, uh, that is the Balkans, seem some states uh, harshly stopping immigrants uh, through violent police system. Uh, the Western side uh, through Ceuta Melilla is also a militarized fortress. Um, the other way is, um, let's say, crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, maybe it's the most dangerous. Um, everyday migrants try to, with small boats uh, overloaded with people. Uh, actually, Mediterranean Sea has become a huge cemetery for the thousands of people that died uh, drowning there. Uh, it's esteemed that uh, about a thousand, uh, 1,700 people drowned just in this year. Um, uh, so uh, also near my town uh, in the area 
uh, close uh, the so-called the Gulf of the Angels. 23 people died recently and uh, um, five uh, bodies of them were found. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's uh, terrible, I think. Um, you know, uh, now um, uh, the ships um, of uh, non-government uh, organization tries to, to help, uh, to save people. But the, what is the answer of the government? Uh, they, they stop um, uh, them from uh, disembarking people. Um, uh, recently, they've allowed uh, um, rapid uh, uh, disembark just uh, for the fragile people, that is children, uh, women uh, <clears throat> in state of distress. Uh, and uh, um, the others that were left to disembark just after days, uh, days uh, uh, during which uh, people had been uh, protesting um, uh, on, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the land. Uh, so, um, but the right thing is to, to let them go, uh, <clears throat> to find relief in a safe port according to the international laws. Um, uh, so, uh, now Italy is going to renew an agreement with Libya, according to which the Libyan Coast Guard will be given by Italy powerful and sweet rubber boats to check the sea in front of Libya, spot the boats of the migrants and take them back to their infernal prisons in Libya. These rubber boats, by the way, are manufactured here in Sardinia, in Olbia. <laughs> ah. That's uh, disgusting, really. Uh, and they are going to renew this uh, uh, criminal agreement. Um, uh, so Libya is now, a gov after the war to overthrow Gaddafi, Libya is now um, a country deeply destabilized uh, with two governments uh, and dominated by criminal bands uh, um, where migrants are imprisoned, brutalized, and blackmailed. Uh, uh, right. Uh, that's an, uh, I have another point uh, which I would like to focus on uh, um, because it still involves uh, a war, a real dirty war. That is the war uh, um, between Saudi Arabia, um, that is from the Saudi coalition against Yemen. Uh, Yemen has been reduced uh, to um, a, a tremendous humanitarian crisis. Because of the war that uh, Saudi, the Saudi coalition engaged and uh, heavy bombardments uh, that hit uh, the country. Um, so these bombs uh, were mostly manufactured here in Sardinia. That's another horrible question by um, a firm, uh, RWM, a company belonging to um, uh, the German Rhine Metal, a multinational of arms. And uh, um, so they uh, manufacture just uh, 50 kilometers from here, uh, right. And uh, um, so several committees have been fighting against uh, the, this factory producing death. And at last they got very interesting results. That is, uh, the, the factory has been blocked uh, in, its, in this uh, bomb export. But uh, the danger is that this new government is uh, uplifting the block and uh, uh, going back to the export of these uh, deadly weapons. Uh, yes, the government of Giorgia Meloni. Um, there's, uh, the Minister of Defense of this government is a guy whose name is uh, uh, Guido Crosetto. He is uh, an arm dealer. Is a, that is a guy who profits uh, on uh, weapons commerce. Uh, it's terrible. And now he's Minister of Defense. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, another point, uh, uh, depending on war, that is uh, climate change. We see now Giorgia Meloni at the Sharm el Sheikh. Oh, yes. And uh, um, I doubt that they will find uh, 
any solution. Um, the situation is worsened, worsened by the war in Ukraine and uh, the consequent cut on Russian gas, uh, which is uh, bringing uh, to a remarkable step back in the fossil fuel decommissioning process. So we see a return to coal plants and uh, uh, the building of regasification plants uh, where methane is, uh, methane is stored in the liquid states, which are plants at risk of major accident. Um, uh, you can imagine well that people are against uh, these plants uh, because they are very often they are too close to inhabited areas. Um, I've recently been to a protest here in a town uh, not too far from me, a Porto Scuso. Um, they want to, to, to settle a regasification plant there. And it's planned to stay a very close, uh, to stay very close to the center of the town. And it's also going to, going to cause environmental damage. Oh. Um, yes, um, war in Ukraine is a really a huge crime against people. Uh, it should have never started and it could have been avoided if only some crucial accords had been put in the right place. Uh, I'm talking about the Minsk agreements regarding the eastern regions of the Donbass, signed in 2014 after the push uh, that said a pro-Western government. Um, the agreement provided a relative autonomy of Donbass, but th they had been never respected. On the contrary, a war was waged against Donbass by the Ukrainian state after a coup d'etat, a war resulting, resulting also on neo-Nazi militias. Um, uh, yes, I had I have a friend who was there uh, trying to understand what was going on, um, and uh, um, he was there with a committee, and then he was back, and uh, and then he discovered that, that he had been put in a blacklist. Yes, because going there and uh, trying to understand what was going on was uh, um, uh, something practically prohibited by Ukrainian government. Um, so the, the war against the Donbass had to, to stay a secret. <laughs> Uh, curiously enough, a war going on for eight years, <laughs> my God. Um, so here the mainstream position is to condemn Putin for the aggression, but let's not forget that the war was already going on in Donbass and it was a totally underreported war. Um, uh, so, um, <clears throat> sure, uh, um, uh, <laughs> The reasonable question should be to find a court to stop the war, but the mainstream political stand is different. It is to send arms to fuel the war. Um, so, um, uh, the, in this sense, the Atlantic state goes on and on with being a passive servant of NATO and the Atlantic Alliance, just as, as in the international missions, uh, meaning intervention in the wars of Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. So to follow this policy, the Italian state has joined uh, the sanctions against Russia, and that has brought to a tremendous rise in the price of energy. <laughs> Lots of firms are at the verge of a collapse and an economic crisis is at the door. So here in Sardinia, this means an intensification of wide military exercises in the military ranges that occupy the Sardinian land. Um, other parts of Italy are also going to be militarized, like the naturalistic area of Coltano, which is going to be turned into a military range. Um, so lots of, lots of people are asking for peace in a loud voice. Um, uh, the last demonstrations on Saturday, the 5th, uh, the 5th of November, filled many streets and squares in towns with the demonstrators. Uh, the greatest was in Rome, but also here in Cagliari, there was a very participated sit-in that lasted hours with a lot of speeches against the war and the sending of weapons in Ukraine. 
Um, so um, uh, people is asking for to close the fire and go to a negotiation. Uh, so, but what the present government uh, is uh, going to do, they have already declared that they will follow Atlantism and Europe. Um, so, um, I've already told you about Guido Crosetto uh, that uh, has announced uh, that uh, military expense cannot be kept under the 2% of the uh, gross domestic product, uh, which means that the budget for asthma will go from 16 million euros a year to 30 million. So uh, it means that uh, uh, the expense for public health is going to be more and more sacrificed uh, as well as for school and other public facilities. So uh, what can we expect? Uh, people's opposition and protest has to become more and more relevant and insistent. That's uh, the only possible way. <laughs> oh, thank you very much uh, <laughs> for your attention. Well, thank you, Mariella and, mm. and Anna for that uh, perspective from Italy, from Europe, from the Middle East. And um, we'd now, I'd like to uh, reintroduce uh, Maria Cristina Gutierrez um, to speak on the uh, Latin American perspective. Um, and um, so Maria, yes, Cristina, I'm Maria, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let me say that, you know, my presentation has to be looking to the point of view that I live in this country and I need to look at the international perspective as to the role that has to be played in this country as to what's going on around the world. And I will say that for a revolutionary movement in the United States or North America, which is not only a capitalist country, but an imperialist country, a country born out of the genocide of the indigenous Native American people, the enslavement of black people brought by force from Africa and the oppression, exploitation, occupation and colonization of countries of black and brown people all over the world. Do not talk about racism and imperialism is a very dangerous proposition. A movement like that can lead to what we had under Hitler in Germany, what was called National Socialism. For a revolutionary movement in the United States or North America to question whether they have a working class and to put the hope in the plumping proletariat to lead the revolution made this possibility of National Socialism even more real and dangerous. I agree to participate in this Revolutionary culture is workers' conferences hesitantly because I don't believe in the cult of the personality. That is also a very dangerous proposition. And I believe that revolutionary cultural workers need to see themselves not as leaders of, but as a part of the organizing force of the working class, not to fight to reform or fix capitalism not to call for the lesser of two evils to be put in power, but to overthrow it by any means necessary once and for all. It is beyond my understanding to see the so-called left and progressive in the United States or North America, not to have an analysis, not to even have a word about the genocide going on today in Palestine or Yemen or Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq a left that is unable to lean the fact that this government has spent trillions of dollars on war against this country, instead of using that money, uh, that money on healthcare, housing, education, and jobs here at home. How is it possible that the so-called revolutionaries in this country cannot raise the consciousness of the workers in this nation to the fact that the future is linked to the future of the workers of the world because this is an imperialist nation. All over the left, in Latin America, in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and here in the United States, are telling the people to vote either for the lesser of two evil or for progressives like Chavez, Maduro, Ortega, Evo, etc. people that I supported even telling us to vote for Biden here in the United States 
as a solution to the problems of the working class. Even calling us fascists, accusing us for supporting fascism if we will refuse it to vote for Biden. But let us ask ourselves, even with these governments in power, how can there be any changes? Let us ask ourselves who owns the means of production, who controls the army, who controls the police, who controls the media. So all these progressive governments are not taking us anywhere in the long run. These progressive governments are making the working class believe that capitalism can be reformed, that it can be fixed, that capitalism can work for the working class, and it is not only not so, but this type of government delays the revolutionary process by decades. As revolutionaries, we need to understand that we are not activists, we are revolutionaries. And a revolutionary knows we need to empower the people so they can overthrow a system and build socialism. Our job is not to become the spoke people or the so-called leader of this working class movement. We are organizers, the one with the vision to organize and overthrow the ruling class and establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. Some of us still believe in that. I'm one of those. Today, the United States of North America is on the verge of taking us to the Third World War. It is bombing Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, the Middle East. That is the international situation. Europe and United States of North America are working together to squash the hopes and dreams of the peoples of the world and uses racism here at home to be able to do so. All these hateful people of color especially black people. The fact that we have so many black political prisoners paying for daring to fight for the freedom for decades that was allowed, allowed for the United, that it has allowed for the United States of North America to go on hunting for our people in our own nations because their racism and white supremacy and Nazi ideology at the heart of the workers of this nation allowed and justify them to do so. There can never be a true revolution in this nation where the factory or culture or workers get together and unite and we do everything possible unless the left addresses this issue and take action against them by uniting those struggle with revolutionary demands. For example, Austerity just talking about the poor immigrants and please let them stay. The demand should be that United States or North America get out of Asia the Caribbean, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. Instead of supporting only the BDS as a solution for the genocide against the Palestinians, we should be denouncing the two-state solution, and our demand should be that the money sent to the so-called state of Israel to more the Palestinian children should be used to harm the homeless right here at home. We should make homeless know that the money used to murder others around the world can give them a home here in this nation and end the crimes against humanity. Our demand should be instead of calling to bring our boys home and stop the war, we should demand that the money in that military budget be used to provide free universal health care for all. Our demand should be to use the war money that murdered children in Yemen to be used to create a real educational center for our children, not babysitter centers, so workers can continue to work two or three jobs and be exploited while the children go to go to work for this and, and take the children in those in this school to learn nothing. Our demand should be that the workers in this nation become the owners of those corporations that they have built with the sweat of their labor. In many countries, Argentina, one of those workers, even in capitalist countries, have taken over the factories and run them themselves, as backwards as these countries may seem to you all. Our demand cannot be defund the police. The workers had more revolutionary de demand to begin with to abolish the police, but the so-called progressive and the so-called left took over and started talking about defunding. Not total defunding, but to take a few pennies here and there. We must ask and demand to abolish the police. They are not only the legacy of the late catches of the 1800s, but they are the tool of oppression of the ruling class against the working class right here at home. We need to demand to create a new and armed entity responsible to the communities that they are to serve and protect. 
we must demand an end to the training of the police here in this nation by the Zionists of the so-called state of Israel. The only way to build a working class movement is when we make workers of the United States of North America understand that the exploitation, oppression, occupation, and colonization of the world is going to be their own destruction sooner or later. Brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, we have time, we have little time to stop fascism from consolidating itself. If we want to do so, we must stop all this revisionism, all this liberalism from taking over the ranks of the revolutionary movement. We need to desperately build a revolutionary working class movement that is able to analyze, develop a, piece, a vision and formulate a program that is able to finally accomplish what we must, the overthrow of capitalism and the building of socialism. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Uh, woo, fire. But I just want to first of all thank uh Anna, thank Mariella, and thank uh, Maria Christina for their just heartfelt uh presentations and the passion behind their words. Um unfortunately we're running a little uh behind in time. So please, if you have questions or comments please uh, use the uh, raise function in the uh, reactions and um, we'll get to you and get your comments and questions. So uh, I believe I got one from Hesu. Yes, and I'll go after others if somebody else wants to go first. I know I have a big mouth, but sometimes I gotta pop off or I'll forget my question, which is why I've been chatting. So first of all, camaradas, that was fucking brilliant. And I appreciated the last, everything was beautiful. A lot of clarity, a lot of understanding. Um, but my question is this, and I'm not being an asshole. I, I mean this, why do the advance have to come from the left? Why can't they just come from the communities that are suffering? And I say this because I'm in a number of political organizations that are very entrenched in politics. They're seeing that as a way they claim to be leftists. They want, you know, cap communist demands essentially. But chingado, you know, you want to talk about a disorganized group of people? Look to the fucking left. You know, um, I don't think the revolution is coming from there at all. The ideas, hey, maybe, but no. The uh, anyway. So that's my question. Do uh, that. That's it. I'll shut up. Uh, would anyone? Like I agree. I agree as <laughs> with uh, what you said also, because in Italy, we have this terrible experience with the so-called left parties. And what they did in these uh, last decades was just to fight um, among themselves, among the, the other left parties, uh, just to, to pursue a high chair in parliament. Now, this is not bad. If you use that power to help the people really, the workers and 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 all and yeah just to to put an end to the injustice and the inequalities but this is what not they don't do this anymore they also distanciate themselves from from the old the old school <laughs> let me call call it like that um of, of the revolutionary thought which was at the beginning in favor of a people or community and try to put together all the workers all the people because we are the majority of the people i mean and the workers are the majority and the people that, that rule the countries every countries are just a minority so first I think we have to understand this point, which is very, very important. I know they have the power because they control, as, as somebody said, the, the, the police, the weapons and, and, and whatever. But we have to take back this responsibility and this power in, in our hands. Uh, could I respond? Yeah, sure, I, Christina. Uh, you know, we... Um... We need to understand what left means. Now that the left has, may make the left such a disgusting thing is one thing, you know, it's like when you were talking about the, whatever, AI, the intelligence, whatever you said, right? And people said, you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. 
But the reality, the reality is that look what happened in these countries where we have, okay, the progressive governments who suffer the consequences when they are taking out like in Bolivia. It is the workers who suffer the consequences. They are the ones who are being persecuted, the poor people. The same thing happens over there, you know, in, in, in every country. But when you look at, you know, so you need, we and, and, and the people, you know, the media, who has the power of the media? Who's telling us to vote for Biden? Who's telling us that all oh, the Democrats won this time? All oh, the people are fed up. No, the people were voting for war because the Democrats offered war. That's what the people voted here in this country. We better analyze that. They voted for war because the Democrats offer war. So we need to have some sort of an organized, uh, and, and it, it, the left shouldn't be intellectuals. The left should be the working people. It should be the workers. It should be, you know, the poor people, the, the one in need. That, that's who it should be. That should be, that to me, left is me. Me, I'm a working class woman. That's my, my, my idea. I want to change the system. Now the intellectuals, we have a lot of intellectuals that are do this kind of work and that they have messed up, they have made mistakes and all that. And I want to add something else, you know. It's easy, how many years do we have of capitalism? Like 500, okay? So why do we expect a socialist country to get better over 500 years of being on the capitalism brothers and sisters, you know, over in 50 years? I believe that in many of these uh, socialist countries that we still have, you know, and in, in, in Cuba, for example, nobody's gonna deny to me that that's a socialist country. I've been there, I see what they do with the people. I can see how, you know, it has the best medical, medical goes to countries all over the world to offer medicine in, in spite of the blockade that it was done because they are socialists, they have a socialist mind idea. I don't know, uh, and I know it's gonna be the ups and downs, ups and downs, but to me, left means opposite of what we have. And I don't mean by the, the left intellectuals, uh, you know, uh, for, for you, you who asked that question, I agree with you. Why not the workers? Yes, it has to be the workers, but we need to give them that idea. Workers know that they are oppressed they need to know that there's an alternative to that oppression, to me. Um, Adam, does that answer your question, the question you posed? Um, thank you. Um, Lou, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, it's an important question. Uh, but I, I wanna go back to the first section to um, that we had, we were talked to begin with about uh, uh, the question of what makes, what's different about this period of time than what was going on, say, in the 1800s. Uh, and, I, and I think the point is that the that we have a qualitatively different um development within the working class that is creating many many more permanently unemployed people it's not a lump and proletariat it's not a you know a, a declassed group of people it's a section of the working class that will never work again and that's a creation of the new technology, very much like the new technology in the 19th century created a new class of people. That is to say, at that point, the industrial worker. Now, what, what I'm getting to is that what was, net, I think what Chris referred to in his presentation was that the, there were certain limits that were possible at that time. Well, those limits have been blown away in our time. And that makes an ideological left kind of passe. What we're really looking at is the development of a whole group of people who are revolutionary, regardless of what they think they are, 
because their demands cannot be answered okay. under capitalism any longer. That's where the unity will come from because it's, it is, um, you know, it's objective. Now, our task as cultural workers is to, within that movement, not separate from it, but within that movement, to, to, uh, to develop that objective unity into a conscious unity. Uh, that's kind of, that's a general way of saying it. But I think what we're going to be talking about in the next section is going to be much more aimed at that direction. So where, where Hiss's question, I think, really hits hardest is really where, you know, what's our role in terms of developing that net, that consciousness? Uh, and it is a question of taking power. It is a question of power. And the cultural worker plays a role in in um in helping that con in helping that consciousness come to uh, come to birth and i guess i'm done thank you thank you lou um james norman yeah um i was just gonna say that i went and read uh hannah rents the origins of totalitarianism this year and um you know if marx once said that history repeats first as a tragedy then as a farce we're kind of in the farce version of fascism i mean everything from trump bolsonaro you just look down the line the reality television i mean boris johnson you just look and um the reason i bring it up is because what's so good about the book is she kind of weaves together history all these different elements anti-semitism colonialism and then eventually the loss the loss of functional places in society for the vast majorities of european countries leading into the civil or into the the uh world war ii and we're at a similar period right now and i just say this because i mean Y'all can see I've still I would I have a house on Jack's right now. Like I definitely work with my hands. And I also live in South Texas. So I'm around a different crowd than the average person who comes around to something like this. And uh you got a problem in this country and every country with a bunch of people whose interests lie with maybe the left, but the left sometimes talks a little too hard about ideas you know we need to understand ideas to have conversations but sometimes you know and i've seen it in the comment section it's like if you really want to make a difference you got to start by feeding people people don't fight revolutions for ideas they fight revolutions for bread they're never one with guns they're one with bread if you fight a revolution with guns all you get is power dynamics changing from one group to the other but same power dynamics so I guess the thing I leave people with is that like my neighbor he's a real nice guy definitely a QAnon supporter you know and every day I try to think how do I reach this guy because I know he's like a decent human being but the stuff he believes is like wild so I think where does this come from where is the root of this how can a person be a halfway decent human but then fall under and you know like i said south texas in the end like i would just really encourage people on the left to imagine what tomorrow's free breakfast program is what are actual things we can do in actual communities in all places of need even places of need with people you don't agree with but that's how you win the fight because if you can prove to people and help you know Oh, and give me this piece to like think I think we get farther and it's at this point a global crisis and again if you have a chance to read Hannah Arendt or revisit her she talks a lot about how how people slide into fascism and I that's my biggest fear is that 
it feels like where we're at today and a lot of what we're talking about right now. So I apologize for. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, we're uh, crunch, getting crunched on time, but we have a couple more questions and comments. First from Sarah and then Hesu. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be, you know, really brief. Um, you know, this this real revolution and certainly this one is coming out of people's struggles, right? For what what they need. It, um, the thing about bread riots that's been said by somebody that that's where revolution start. I mean, there's always been people who have the idea of revolution as a good thing and that society is, you know, saw the inequalities, saw the injustice and wanted a better. And those, those are our visionaries. But how do you get a revolution, an actual revolution? And as, as Christina said, it's the workers. It's, and the workers, especially when workers begin to be thrown out so they can't earn what they need. They become jobless, so they can't earn what they need to keep a roof over their head. And, you know, right here in San Francisco right now, you know, half of half of Salesforce with the butt plug building, you know, that we hate, just chopped. Where are those workers going to end up? Um, you know, look what Elon Musk is just and these are these are the privileged workers. These are the high paid workers. Some of them will go somewhere else and and be OK. But this thing is shaking up this this society from the top to the bottom, really. We've got a very small, you know, um, filthy rich class and the rest of us are suffering. And. You know, they're they're moving to cut off the little bits of of, you know, little bits of what they give to what they give. Right. We earned it. We work for it. But they give us Social Security. Right. They're going to aim for that. We've got we've got a situation where the whole society is in crisis because capitalism is collapsing and the ruling class wants to hold on to power. So they're going to impose fascism on us, you know, um, make us slaves, murder us, genocide us. And I think people see that coming down and and they're grabbing on to all kinds of crazy ideas because they're in a panic. And it's up to the revolutionaries that are clear to to unify people along their common interests and and just and say that there's a better way. And that we if we seize power, if we unify, unify and seize power, we can have a decent society. There are people have done it. Cuba did it, you know, and they're taking care of their people and, and giving them health care. And I'm going on too long, but but this is not an ideological thing. We need ideology. We need thoughts. We need to understand how society works and we need to understand how how to formulate one that does work, you know. But we've got to ground ourselves in these real struggles and, and unify people along their common interests. How can we do it? That's that's the conversation we need. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hey, Sue. Thank you, Conrad. I actually had a question for the brother who just spoke, but um, I've been grappling with this. It fucking makes me angry that we have babies in these detention centers, even here in Chicago which is supposed to be a fucking sanctuary city. They have 64 on a company miners. They don't give them fucking shoes. They don't have jackets. They don't clean. This is like fucking worse in prison, right? So my thing is that what point are people going to be like, fuck this shit, I'm done. They can't be killing our kids no more on the streets of Chicago. They can't be denying health care for people. We have a so many homeless people in Chicago right now that we could have the 51st ward. Think about that. That is fucking criminal. You know, and and um, but the real point I was gonna make is these refugees that are coming to us, 
they are they are the new class. They come in with revolutionary ideology or a thinking that is so more way more profound than Americans have. And I think we got to really think about how, how do we how do we unify with them too and and include them in this revolutionary process. You think about it. They left one country driven by capitalism to the belly of the beast, and they ain't gonna get treated better here. And if another motherfucker tells me to send them home, I swear to God, I'm gonna punch some motherfucker in the face. Cause that is a pat answer I've been getting like, well, they should go home. Things are so bad in Pilsen, they should go back home. Fuck you, you know? Anyway, my question though was this, has there been a, a moment, um, brother who spoke his name, I'm forgetting, from Texas, I'm from Arizona, by the way, so I feel you, where, where you, you, you were able to change the mind of someone because you helped them get some kind of basic need met. That was my question. I mean, I, again, I think it's a long game thing. Um, I don't think anybody changes anybody's minds. I think sometimes if you just take the time to hear people out, I know this isn't what you're supposed to have to do. And it's like labor and all that unpaid labor to listen to people. But sometimes if you let them talk it out, ask some questions, understand better where they're coming from, it's easier to communicate back to them and maybe show them some new ways of thinking at the world. You know, I just, especially in every, everywhere but i just don't get that far by arguing to speak to your specific point it's like i'm not again i'm just telling you the world i live in but like you know we talk about like detention centers and stuff well in my experience here because the way that dynamics and racial dynamics work the people that i hear the most negative commentary about mexican immigrants from in south texas are like actually second generation Mexican immigrants who feel more social pressure to be disapproving because it makes them a part of the in-group. So I'm just saying that like people do weird, strange things in order to like fit into this human thing and being kind, giving people the ability to like, you know, to spin themselves out. I, the thing I wanted to say earlier that'll make it make more sense is if you don't give people bread they're hungry and they'll eat that hunger which is grievance politics and that's the world we're in now if you don't feed those people somehow somehow which is why i say community organizing there's plenty of things that you can do to make someone's life better my guy who's the QAnon guy i just helped him build a staircase at his house it was one of the reasons I like him is I got to see the trailer he lives in with his kids with a fridge that he uses as a pantry. Like, I get why maybe he's angry. I don't think his anger is placed in a healthy direction for him or anybody else. And it certainly scares me. But like, by the end of our talk, I didn't talk any politics. By the end of it, he could just tell that I definitely wasn't a QAnon supporter or even conservative. And I think for him, that exposure, without having to say a single thing, will just make him think harder about this anger he has for people that he disagrees with. But if you believe you're on the right side of history and, and you have a good argument to make, I just really think the best way to make that argument is through your actions, through community work, organizing. And in a room like this, I always tell people, like, anything tangible you know, mutual aid, anything tangible that you can do will get you so far in this world because they're not going to save us. But I'm done again. Uh, thank you, James. Um, we have not heard from uh, David Cobb and he's in stack right now. So we'd like to get his question in and then I think we can draw this uh, session to a close here. So David. Thank you, comrades. This has been profound. Uh, it is and refreshing to hear uh, art and culture workers as labor having uh, this level of conversation. So I, I think for, I agree. I, I, the The idea of material, tangible benefits and infusing that with genuine political education that I think that folks like Lerna are absolutely uh, capable and 
uh, as critical to do. I wanted to put forward the, the transition that I've made in my work uh, and the language around non-reformist reforms, like community land trusts and uh, worker-owned cooperatives and public banking and participatory budgeting. Not because I think that capitalism can ultimately be reformed, but because working on those reforms undermine the logic of capitalism itself. And you you actually are, in fact, feeding people and housing people. Uh, and then by doing that, and if anybody is interested in that, I would be like super down to talk about how, and I'll drop my, uh, my contact into the chat. I uh, currently work uh, as a, uh, for the Weot tribe, where we're putting this into practice uh, here in Northern California. But I also am the co-coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Uh, and frankly, I'm trying to, and I'm also a Green Party member, and I'm trying to red the greens and green the reds. So I'll drop my, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm not a league member, but I've always felt like y'all were on fucking point on the line and understanding what is actually happening. And straight up, I've learned more from league members than almost anybody else in movement spaces. Peace. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you, David, that was that was great. Um, wow, this, no, oh, this has been, we could continue this discussion, I think for another half hour easily, um, but, Thank you, comrades, for your uh, presentations. Anna, Mariella, Christina, M Maria Christina, um, I think you really opened up the discussion and put it on this uh, international, global uh, landscape. And so we really need to see how what's happening in this country is happening in other parts of the world and how we're all interrelated, and how we're all affected by what goes on, the struggles for uh, liberation around the world. So thank you all for uh, participating in this. Thank you uh, for your questions and your comments. And at this point, I'd like to uh, toss it over to uh, Richard Crawwick. And I'd like to read a little bit about Richard. Richard, um, We'll be moderating our next section. He's the he published fiction, poetry, plays, feature articles, creative nonfiction, most recently a novel, Les Paralyses, as a French original by Tutupala Press. And um, he's worked for decades facilitating writing workshops in homeless shelters, women's shelters, and literary sites, etc. And um, he is a uh, community active, he's the founder of the Community Active Press, Jakar Press, and a member of the Cultural Committee. Richard, I welcome you, and thank you all again for staying with us. Thank you. Wow. Everyone should put your hands in the air and shake them around, get some energy. It's like, it's been a long day. I just feel so overwhelmed with all these great ideas. Um, Obviously, we're running uh, late as these things do go and people engage in intelligent conversations.